Um, on we go. Um, so the camera is not working, sorry to people, uh, but you still see the slides anyway. Uh, that should be uh, close enough. All right, uh, let's get back to that idea so we get to some of those concepts that are used in build tools. So if you're at some stage feeling yourself inclined to write shell scripts, that's what actually what people did. They wrote their own shell scripts to you know, facilitate make and so on. And the idea was, there, okay, can't we standardize it in some way or another? And AMP was the first approach to do this, particular um, in the kind of context of Java world, and uh, you know, in extension, then also Kotlin and so on. Um, this is this is quite relevant. And the idea was basically there that you um, model the notion of targets. So, what do I want to um, achieve, right? And the user can then initiate and say, "Hey, run and target," right? So, um, so for example, if we have this one here. Um, this is a complete end script, very short one built by, um, and it has a project name for text, for example. Um, the, um, the default target is compiled, right? By default, if you just run end in that folder, it will run the target uh, compiled, uh, and the base directory is a local one. So you can also specify whether it should actually compile a different directory from the one that you're currently in, right? So it's quite easy. Um, and then you have things like properties that are valid across the entire script uh, or, or XML um, um, document, such as source and build, for example, and various uh, targets that you can specify. So, and if we browse through that, um, let's have a look at this. Um, we actually have two targets. One is called init, and one target is compile. As you recall from here, compile is the default one that would be run. Please stay on. It's what? It's not on. That's um, sad. It says it's streaming. I can stop it and start it again. It usually starts with a delay of a minute or so, so that could be the confusion there. Um, right. Yeah, we need to use a good for an alternative streaming tool, I guess, um, to make that more consistent. I think, and literally, uh, after this session, I will have to talk about this, how we can make this better for real time teaching. If we were to need to go into the dark mode and actually do this kind of remotely, uh, then we want to have interactive facilities um, so to, to accommodate. For now, we need to live with it. Um, I also like, like the nice ambient noise. I don't know um, if you appreciate me for the side of um, so we have two targets here, basically, that you can run. Right? One is a compile, so it's written like this, basically. An attribute of the target is compiled as the name, and it depends on init. So you can chain different targets in this particular, right? So what does it actually do, this target? Well, you know, it runs Java, what's Java? Java. Yeah, the Java compiler, right? So if you run by Java by command line, you run Java C, I don't know if you ever call the force to do it, hope not. Anyway, it says compile everything in the source directory and put it in the build, uh, build target directory, right? Those ones here are variables defined as properties, source and build, and they point to actual directories on a particular machine that you're building for, right? But a prerequisite for this exercise is, is the execution of the target in it, which is this one. What does this do? Well, the target in it runs make dear and actually creates a directory. So uh, have a parent there. And you see, that's a very classical end move um, to, to just specify uh, tasks in terms of those um, near Unix commands, right? Basically, it reflects pretty much what would be run on the command line, but wraps it in some sort of uh, XML representation and surrounds it by targets that are then linked and properties. So this is, of course, a very simple example, but it still highlights how it in principle works. No, this is this is uh, this file would be called build.xml. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the main thing is That's correct. That's correct. Yes. So and has uh, the concept of uh, modules there, yeah, that uh, and basically you can write your own translation of the command. So you could well translate it, but it would just be one for yourself, but rather the invocation of this module. Yeah. Right. So think about like plugins. So if you need your other command because that has changed, I don't know, whenever it would be. I don't think you will ever need because it's a 
a massive amount of those uh, um, um, plugins available for end because they've been around for such a long time. So I'm certain you find all the features you would need. But that's um, at least the name, the flavor is a bit like this, that right? you follow the commands. But no, it does not run those native commands. So it's not a generic plugin that then runs the command, but it's actually specific uh, um, um, uh, command that is mapped to, you know, hard, hard coded uh, and mapped to the particular execute. So that's kind of um, the thing there. So, and okay, that works well for simple cases, right? We see that. It's kind of nice, different targets, no magic, but you can also do control flow. And that's where things get a bit messier, um, as, as you see here. So what you have in addition to those targets, target, target, uh, another target, and another target, you see that they are wrapped as usually in good uh, XML fashion, that they are wrapped in uh, kind of those target uh, leading text and uh, nest, uh, text. There's also a notion of nested targets. For example, you have an inner target or an inner um, um, an alternative branch and so on. So you can kind of come on relatively complex um, um, construct, right? So in this case, for example, if, the, if we run this project with this flow of control, the default target is nested in, this one here. What does it do? Well, it actually checks uh, a property condition. Um, uh, and the property condition but that it checks, basically your if statement, if you like, is whether a file is available. So available file, file one. If that file is available, then um, call the end, make an end call to target then, alternatively to else. OK, where is then? Well, then is here. And else is down here. So, the indentation is a bit off, I think. Um, so, alternatively, you execute this body here, or you execute this body down here. This target itself, however, has an inner condition. It checks for the property inner condition, so existence of another file, for example. I mean, you can, you can formulate those conditions otherwise. Basically, it's Boolean uh, evaluation. And if that is the case, it either calls the inner then or the inner else. Right, so so you can have this nested uh, conditional branching that uh, is represented here. It's not entirely beautiful and extremely verbose, as you notice. Right, so that's all control flow here. There's hardly anything that's actually done. Well, it's nothing is actually done. Um, so it's quite extensive in that respect. Um, that w w uh, as to what you can um, actually do. And but just to get an appreciation of the different uh, built-in tasks. All right, we don't see what I'm doing. But here at the good old end menu, you see it's really 1990. So, but never. There are different tasks that are categorized by uh, rough uh, categories, right? So, for example, if Java extension tasks are specific to tasks. Uh, and then we'll see how actually what kind of uh, compilers that actually supports out of the box. Java, we just talked about this. Um, um, some tool that it, uh, it, uh, determines the um, out of so out of um, date um, classes, for example, and affords the compilation. Um, some other compilers, the RMIC compiler, this is for remote method invocation um, um, that kind of um, compiles the uh, stacks uh, for that purpose. And so on, a lot of different uh, so-called tasks. So execution tasks. Here you can uh, co control the execution nature. For example, if parallel or sequential, you can say run those two tasks in parallel. So even that exists. You can sleep. So basically, if you need to have a sleep timer for whatever else, because you need to wait for something to come up, you can do this. And you have a lot of file tasks, and you'll see all the Unix commands that you're acquainted with, such as change group, ch mod, ch own, concatenation, copying. And so on. So it's all the same pattern. So you basically combine your entire script based on the snippets, more or less, of uh, um, that are called end tasks. And it's quite exhaustive. So uh, I um, think that you, and in, in worst case, you can actually call the file system uh, commands natively as well. Uh, so you just run commands on the given operation. Not, not recommended, of course, because that breaks the idea of having the 
uh, operating system independent to some extent, um, well, to a strong extent, uh, but that's an option as well if needed. So let's end enough pain. Um, it's, I think it's still worthwhile knowing this thing, just you know, to know the history, because you, you want to be uh, 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 not repeat history of mistakes to some extent. And I said, oh, cool, I have the next new build system, let's try it in Belgium. Um, and because I have been done. So, all right. Quite a bit of work. Uh, XML can be very verbose. We talked about this in the uh, data format sector already anyway, that the advantages and disadvantages are the opportunities that have uh, to some extent exploits, but also unnecessities to some extent. And there are various um, different um, alternatives. The main, main two ones is Maven and Ivy. Um, I primarily talk about Maven here. Uh, perhaps if I remember, I'll just make some comments on uh, Ivy afterwards. So, um, and Maven is literally kind of the, or has has become or has been in any case, the default system for any Java-based application. Um, because there was mostly uh, a set in the enterprise context, very mainstream development and complex um, uh, systems. Um, and the idea of Maven was to deal with all the shortcomings of ends, that is, the uh, build files were all pretty much basically a mapping from shell scripts to XML and wider set. So there were no hardly any standardization um, other than being represented in XML. So you could not assume certain uh, the order of execution and so on. So it was very uh, messy, very um, 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 custom. So every time you have a build script, you actually need to look into detail and try to parse it again and see what it means. Maven wanted to clean up with this. Uh, and the main idea was there, actually, you know, we work with conventions. So the idea is there. We assume that each um, uh, Maven build uh, process consists of those following stages, um, or, or, or um, phases, rather, right? They are, they are variations. You can move some, you can append some. But you need to be explicit. And those include, of, first of all, figuring out whether the uh, source that is provided um, is complete and it actually works, so meaning everything can be resolved in the first place. Then do the compilation of the project, test the project, um, with the corresponding uh, unit test framework. Usually it's JUnit, realistically. Um, package the whole stuff, right? For example, in JAR packages, if that's uh, needed. Um, verification, so if you need to run integration uh, tests, those will be implemented here. Uh, and then follow it by an install phase, where, um, yeah, where basically the, the, the um, project is submitted, for example, to a repository, so others can download and use it. And then deployment phase, which is uh, the phase where it's actually put in the runtime environment, and the um, um, environment is uh, used, supposed to be used then in production. So that's roughly the, um, the different phases. It's it's not 100% um, exhaustive because they, of course, came up with slightly more extensive. Um, So um, not both those projects, or many of the projects that I'm talking about, are all of Hatcher managed right now. So this is here, you see the, the, the life cycle, and you see that the fault life cycle is slightly more extensive. It has kind of nested um, um, phases in there, but it's really, 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 really long, right? So, um, so that's quite kind of extensive. So the idea is there that anything that you possibly do with code can be embedded in one of those stages. The idea was basically to generalize any sort of build process. And you need to decide where you put your stuff in. The interesting thing is there, then it becomes very structured. Because if you're acquainted with the Maven convention, it's very easy for you to read new repositories and read the build file accordingly. Adapt it and move on. So the maintainability was the main point that was increased. Um, so, and, and how is that specified? Well, uh, in Maven, we are using um, so called um, home files. Project object model here. Yeah, yeah. Again, XML. Um, and the idea is there that, um, that um, you're not only supporting um, the compilation based on fixed um, phases of the process, but also modularity. So you allow the integration of external modules, both by downloading them automatically, having dependency management, say about X or something like this, in equivalent. But maybe we can do this for you as well. So it's made in repositories. Have a look at this briefly in a second. Um, 
but uh, um, one of the other main features is that you actually can have nested pumps as well. So if your project, for example, has subdirectories that have uh, uh, contain independent modules of your system that you want to build, those can be um, specified independently. So um, remember, recall the end example that I showed you with all the nestedness and so on. Basically, it would mean that everything needs to be modeled in the top layer twice, right? So, but if uh, for example, a one team works on one sub module, another one on a different one, but all somewhat in the shared kind of project. Um, then the third file would always need to be modified by all involved, right? But in this case, you can actually have separate project ob uh, project object model ties in each of those subdirectories, and may would uh, dynamically compose them into what is called the effective POM, which is a bit of a challenge, but that's um, that's what you want to uh, would 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 generally. Um, see, so let's see if I can. So this is a typical form file you would see. Uh, it does something like um, again, it sits in the main directory, it's similar to the build XML. It says something about uh, which may may be where you're committing to. Uh, it identifies the application that you are writing, so it's a unique identifier, and that's kind of a globally unique identifier, if you like. Um, we get to that why. Um, there are certain properties that you can specify again. So, for example, uh, here's the text specification of the source code version that you want to compile against. This case, Java again. And then down here, you specify simply dependencies, um, dependencies like this, right? So, in combination with a fixed folder layout, so that's something I um, didn't uh, talk about yet, in combination with a fixed folder layout, something like this, so uh, it's generally the base layout is as follows, you have the app, you have the source folder, source folder contains the main branch and a test branch, right, so that's the, the whole idea, and then the whole package structure um, in those respective um, uh, branches is laid out in parallel, basically, right, so when we have, for example, an app Java somewhere, we need to have an app text in the corresponding folder in the text branch. So that's the, one of the conventions that main prescribes. The good part about it is, you see that the, uh, you saw the pump, um, which is completely declarative. It basically just says, well, you know, guess what? That's the name of my application. Please compile it this way. That's what I want. And you probably need J unit, otherwise the testing thing will not work out. And then you just run main, uh, uh, the main command. And it will, if you commit it to those conventions, then there's no questions as to where do I find the source code, where do I find the test, uh, test code, and so on. But it will just go ahead and build it. So those pumps can be quite short if you have very uh, straightforward, uh, standard, um, best, um, you know, projects. So it's very different that you're not. So you yeah, say maybe package basically build up to the uh, package stage. We just saw the life cycles before. What would that mean? It basically iterates up to this level. So it basically would uh, do all the pro uh, all the individual lifecycle phases, including testing, up to this level, and you're uh, arriving at a final, uh, at a package there. So that's the idea as well. So highly standardized, you're working by convention, both lifecycle, as well as folder layout, minimizes your need for configuration, but maximizes your commitment, right? Because you really need to buy into this. If you want to deviate from it, both in terms of folder layout, if you want to have additional phases, Bit of fun, um, so that's not uh, yeah, it's not something that is actually considered uh, to could, could be done. So basically, um, yeah. Anyway, so that's just a um, few few aspects I just wanted to share. So you get some intuition how Maven ticks in contrast to uh, and in particular. Again, if you want to have a comprehensive overview of the polar layout, that's uh, something here I took from uh, from, from, the, from the specification. So it uh, also assumes that you have the source code files in a corresponding uh, subdirectory here, Java, of course, uh, but separated from the source files, for example, right? So think about assets and games and something like this that you may use. They're also separated. If uh, you have web application, but on the front end, they would be located here um, and so on. So um, the idea is a bit, um, that it's a quite structured approach um, to be done. I'm show the example just now. Um, so main repositories, and this is the main novel. So apart from this convention-based approach, the main novelty that had made it so successful and have made it succeed. The fact is that Maven still exists uh, and is still actively used, largely depends on this. 
And the idea is there that all the dependencies, we just a J unit listed there as an example, house in some sort of repository, really like an end, uh, sorry, an F, uh, so the F to, um, a tool that can indebt in special bunch of uh, Linux distributions, um, is to um, really allow this um, to dynamically fetch the necessary dependencies. And they can either lie in a local repository on your machine, because they're of course fetched there, uh, in your organization, so you can run on your own thing, very similar to the Linux distro, or of course, uh, central community based ones, which are quite well known. For example, the Maven Central is one of the main known ones there. Um, I, I just uh, just go there just to give you a feel. And this model, even though um, it, it originally was completely associated with Maven, has become extremely successful. So um, this whole repository system has been expanded. Oh, really? Interesting. Has been uh, expanded. I do have internet. Still do have the internet. That's slightly sad. Um, right. So, um, so uh, that's so it pretty much is a central repository that allows you to um, deploy uh, a library, for example, dependencies and so on centrally, and they actually pull from here as well then. Dependency actually you want, and you do this on this basis here. Um, I unfortunately I don't get the sign. I wanted to, which has kind of a generic uh, um, URI that points you to the uh, repository, kind of the repository uh, site more generally. Because the beautiful thing is that this um, repository idea has been appropriated for most other businesses as well. They use the same name uh, uh, principle. Uh, they just do slightly URL structure. Uh, and require different specifications because here we are possibly. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, we actually see, see here for some different programming. Uh, uh, so, hey guys, a few more minutes, then we're good. Um, but what you need to specify is basically the um, EDD um, project that we're going to import, then you're in this example, and of course it's version. And then Maven will dynamically resolve this and try it, of course, in the ascending order from looking at the local repository first to have a cache. Then organizational repositories, if it's if it's specified, or else goes back to those central repositories, which are usually hard uh, coded initially into uh, main, but also in Gradle. So Gradle uses the same thing. And you see on the right uh, that uh, how how the dependencies would be specified. So you basically just copy and paste this bit here into your uh, POM file and run it, and then it will download the dependencies. Uh, in, in Gradle, it would look like this. You just say implementation, and so slightly more concise, you see. It just says uh, implementation, J unit, J unit, uh, and then 413. So group ID is kind of more generic, what is the product about, uh, within what the artifact uh, name, in this case, exactly is similar, but it could be, for example, having a larger, um, uh, larger application from which um, the artifact is based in from the subset. And then, of course, the corresponding version. And again, you can see that picture here. So when you put this to Gradle, what Gradle does is actually retrieve it from a Maven repository uh, for you. Um, so, and there's for Kotlin down there as well, which is of course fairly um, similar to to Ruby, um, uh, which is not a surprise, of course. Um, Scala uh, in Ivy. What else do we have? Lining and Lining is a build tool for uh, Clojure. Does anyone know Clojure? This kind of function is a list inspired um, uh, list dialect, um, also Java based. Apache uh, Builder, and so on. So, I mean, you find a large, so you see this this whole Maven repository idea has been kind of appropriated widely and can be used a lot of different build names. So, be aware of this, even if you don't use Maven, that this thing exists because it makes your life quite a bit, uh, quite a bit easier in this one, in this context. Okay, um, 
Okay, yeah, um, basic commands are basically then something you can also chain different uh, um, um, stages. So if you, for example, you can say maybe install it says run everything up to uh, install. Uh, and but if you run this way, for example, maybe clean install, it will run everything up to the ma uh, clean stage first, which means clean all uh, pre compiled effects or you know previous compilation artifacts, whatever, and then run the entire process up to the install um, stage, basically in the life cycle. And if you want to push it all the way, you say maybe clean the toy, right? So yeah, yeah, run everything to the front. So it's really convenient. Um, we turn this. Uh, one of them, of course, you super buying into conventions, right? File system, uh, file layout, of course, um, and um, the, the the structure if you want. What is really hard, can be really hard, is to keep track. That means if you have a lot of um, um, projects that have a lot of nested folders, they have their own respective uh, home files. It's really hard to figure out which is the one that is currently applied because it's that dynamic uh, component store for execution. So that's, uh, there's some commands available in, in Maven that actually allow you to show me what's the effective form for this folder, just for that purpose. So it's not quite easy, uh, quite hard, uh, quite easy to think. A bit Java centric. Um, it can be used for other purposes as well, but it has been built for Java, and that's very obvious. Um, and, and of course, uh, JVM based languages such as you know Scala, Kotlin, uh, Closer, not Closer, no, that's too far off because it's a different paradigm. But Scala, uh, but Scala is only a tool in this kind of work. It's very verbose, very, um, still considered very verbose, particularly in output if you run this. Um, there's a lot of notions for plugins. So for anything you need to do, you need to download plugins. I'll show you an example in a bit. Uh, because plugins fix all the aspects that are not considered as part of the convention. Right? So if you need to do something that's outside the, the box, then it becomes kind of really annoying. It does not, that's annoying, it does not contain a uh, compilation of this thing. So if you are uh, you saw the extensive list of life cycle stages. So if you run through those, right, and it saves the compilation stage, it does everything again uh, once you call it again. So it can be very time consuming uh, there. So it doesn't have a notion of that. Um, yeah. So, um, ah, the other thing is nested dependency management. It's something I didn't really think about. Was if a dependency arrives on another dependency, then it's not automatically downloaded. Right, so that's different to F, F does that cleverly, right? It keeps the dependency graph, maybe not so much. So you need to keep that track of this yourself as well. But then again, there's uh, this, this big support and there's a massive community, the repository is really helpful in this respect. Um, and so it's a good good for the baseline. And um, the main of copyright, one of the narratives about Maven was always it, uh, every time we run it, we download the entire internet. Uh, because that's roughly all here. They found so many uh, dependencies because all those modules and so on, they become really, really sluggish unless, until you have it on the machine, of course. Um, so that's really, what's really annoying because it took more time downloading dependencies than using compiling, especially on moderate performance internet connection. One of the concerns at that time, today is probably not justified anymore because, first of all, you have better connectivity, but also we're more used to cloud based solutions and work anyway. At that time, it was really weird that. Everything needed to be pulled from the internet is supposed to be downloaded initially uh, and you know perhaps updated, but not dynamically downloaded. So um, just, just just one simple example for pain. Uh, before I um, conclude this, um, so I was uh, once in a situation of uh, building a tiny. Uh, building, building, plugging, whatever else doesn't matter really. So the challenge was there. Um, so um, I have a set of dependencies I'm relying on, right? So it was uh, extended for for a tool that exists out there that I that I wrote, and uh, it is actually quite straightforward. Um, you have, you know, that is how uh, how this artifact is called. There are the repositories that um, that are used for downloading any dependencies. You can specify them unless they're given. Uh, they're not. Um, uh, the, especially if they deviate, so you could call them, for example, your Maven repository is one uh, popular one, the other one is jittech.io, or two words for Google has its own one. Um, specifying properties and then specifying dependencies, and uh, yeah, that is roughly what it's, what it's, what it's, actually, what it's actually doing. Um, I'm not going into this. So, yes, and then it becomes ugly because I need to have a lot of plugins, and now I just motivate why I need the plugins. 
So this was the high level POM file that I just showed you, basically just showing the artifact dependencies and so on and possible plugins I needed. So uh, if, if going into one particular subfolder, um, doing the same thing, it basically just specified dependencies, nothing else. Literally, this is what this thing is called, sounds good. Make a packaging as a jar file. Here's dependency number one, it's the uh, Neto software, for example, or uh, Scala was the dependency as well. Uh, Pico container, um, I, I, this was a dependency for something else, so it's a nested dependency, um, and so on. So various dependencies, but nothing really complicated other than having annoying a lot of dependencies there. My problem was, though, that uh, I wanted to have this uh, tool built um, against two different APIs of that, you know, um, software that I wanted to build a plugin for. So that has changed over time. And instead of providing um, two, that's in two separate projects, my idea was, hey, can't I use Maven to dynamically, uh, at compile time, change the source code, right? Uh, substitute some import or modify certain lines of codes and so on, right? So you know, there was very few modifications needed just to have it run against a different API. So I felt that was the easier way. So I thought, okay, let's try Maven and see how it goes. Um, and this is an example for deviating from the standard view. So this is straightforward. Um, I'm not sure if that's, that's the wrong one. And this was the one. So it starts nicely. Uh, we still have this idea of having the identifier. Uh, dependencies are specified. But here, that's, that's where it becomes slightly nasty. Um, so in the build section, I uh, opted for refining certain certain aspects and use plugins to, to do precisely this. Um, Simple things include, um, I actually wanted to exclude files from combination. That's how you do it. You can say, and, you know, um, test exclude this particular file, for example, in this part of the compilation process. But then it becomes slightly weirder because I wanted to do replacement of um, um, encode um, text within, within files, right? So, and here's what I had to do is basically take the original file, make a copy of it, um, at least that was my plan. Um, make make a copy of it um, um, of two files in fact, in fact, and have the fun, uh, ability to reinstall those files, of course, again. Uh, but after the um, you know copying process, I actually modified the file. For this purpose, I need the Maven Replacer plugin, which is of course a different plugin again, which um, added additional go into the process resources, uh, process sources, uh, um, and that is the execution of the replace function, which includes replacing, um, here's an example, which uh, look for tokens within a particular file, in this case, for example, in this particular file, you can get extension, and replacing the API version based on um, a um, regular expression variant, uh, specifically used in Maven, against a different uh, version, so I need to declare, oh, I'm using a lower version, so please find any occurrence of network extended API version and so on, then furthermore replace certain imports and so on. So suddenly, out of this rather straightforward process, it becomes super laborious and tedious, right? The specification is kind of really annoying and uh, by no means handy anymore. So I, um, at that time, I probably should have considered just having, maintaining two different versions of the code base, uh, which probably would have been easier and just accommodating something that's slightly off the beaten track. Just want to make it, uh, raise awareness here that's painful to go off the beaten track because that takes you hours for just getting this somehow right until it actually works. Um, so that's just a small deviation from, from, the, uh, from, from the main thing. So Maven is really about convention and it's about flexibility uh, and um, platform independence. Um, and those are just a kind of standards. IED fixes, by the way, the dependency management problem, so it's, it's able to catch on next dependencies. Also, it's a slightly different conception of, um, uh, of um, configurations, as they call them. So the idea is there, in Maven, you say, hey, I'm using this particular JUnit version for the entire project. Here you can say, well, what dependency do I use for which particular uh, configuration of that tool? So if you have five different uh, configurations for a given code base, uh, then you can have um, slightly different dependencies, for example, or configuration of dependencies, or different database versions, or whatever else. So it's slightly more flexible, it's kind of oriented slightly differently, um, um, but yeah, um, slightly different take on this problem. Slightly less structure, a bit more flexibility than Maven, that's the main point um, of this. And Gradle kind of was the approach or intent to kind of unify this a bit more. On the one hand, have a very well structured approach. Um, to develop, um, uh, to, 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 to running the build process, having fixed 
reasonably thick scholar layout with a bit more flexibility, but not as rigid as um, Maven, but still benefiting on the uh, particular use of the repositories, and so doing the automatic download, which you probably have gotten very used to. Uh, and as a final feature, it's programmable. It's actually a, it's programmable in, in Groovy itself, right? So as a programming language. So instead of hacking around and me downloading modules that allow me to rename a file or a copy a file, you can actually just run this command maybe in Groovy if you want. So it kind of made everything more flexible. That was the main main point. And um, just to, uh, of course, by uh, choosing this particular representation, of course, uh, in, 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 this form having this Groovy uh, based DSL really, um, it was over to over or able to reduce the overhead considerably. Right again, that's the typical native comp file. Here's the same thing in, in Gradle, right? You basically just say, hey, that is Java, all the rest is coming with Java. Um, the, 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 the application that we're working on will be identified um, as follows. It's equivalent to this group ID, artifact ID, and version, um, and so on. And then we are using the repository Maven Central, so as a function that is coding, coded into Gradle, that's the URL to Maven Central to download all the dependencies. There's other ones as well. You can also override those, of course. And then you just say, hey, those are the dependencies. For the compilation stage, um, for the test compilation, I need a unit, that's it. And it downloads that stuff. So you have seen that before, right? Every time you open the build of Gradle, you see some configurations like this, plus a lot more, because this is, of course, generic Gradle, not Android Studio Gradle, which has a uh, um, set of domain-specific um, extensions. But just to get the motivation right, it simplifies the specification a lot, and it's quite readable, uh, of course. So cross-platform has relative dependency management, yay. So if the uh, dependency has a dependency, it does it for you, sort of. Um, it still follows the convention over configuration approach, um, working by convention, particularly when it comes to the folder layout, which you know. Uh, already from Android Studio, because any Android project is very fixed in its layout, you only have flexibility within the uh, package uh, level, right? So it's a kind of a mix of imperative and declarative. Declarative means, okay, uh, uh, tell the system what uh, what you want, to, what it should do, and it should achieve. Imperative would mean give the system procedural instructions as to how to achieve it, uh, and you can do both because it's actually programmable. Um, it can have multi-project builds. So it can differentiate between different projects and so on. And it's much more widely able to capture different programming languages, Scala, for example, but also C++. Uh, it affords parallel execution. That's quite nice. And it uh, uh, allows also incremental diff. So it keeps track of uh, compile state and only looks for the diff, actually. So if, if you, for example, partially compile or modify a particular file in your Android project, then it only, of course, recompile that particular file and reintegrate it. As opposed to starting the entire process again, as it was in um, uh, Maven. So that's the idea. So uh, yeah, so that's basically um, the idea. The, the the fundamental concepts that um, Gradle has the build script that um, provides the configuration that it um, captures everything that belongs to your project. Uh, the project, of course, the uh, code that you need, um, which may contain additional tasks on top of the build script. Then uh, the task is a instruction, basically, that needs to be atomically executed. So um, uh, Gradle guarantees that either something transaction safety executed guarantees that something is executed or not. It's not half-baked. Um, in Maven, that's very well possible. And there's also a notion of having a report at the end to show you what went wrong, what went right. If you saw, for example, the testing, that's actually quite nice. Uh, reporting uh, built in, but it also has the ability to export it, for example, in uh, XM, uh, in HTML. Okay, I'm not going into this. Yeah, that's the greater DSL. Basically, how to you, uh, you know, how can you extend uh, your your um, more explicitly? But I'm not going. There's some conventions. I'll buy. There are lots of conventions. Uh, lot more limited. So we have the project layout that you know sources main. Programming language potential resources plus X because in Android it's slightly different. Um, then you have certain convention properties that you can use, meaning you can just write in your build script, uh, for example, the source compatibility you want to maintain right, with Android version, for example, uh, source sets. Uh, what um, the, the um, I, I don't know. I'm interrupting. Um, 
and certain direct names. So they're, they're, they're given primitives that you can use at any time in the build script, so that are recognized and the system will look for if they exist. And then you have this default process. And that's a lot, 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 lot easier, right? Because uh, only consists of compile compilation process along with the necessary resources, let's say assets, that are drawn into the process. The generation of classes, jar files, and the assembly and build fundamentally, if it's, for example, packaged in a way. So a lot of lot of simpler in its approach, but still relies on conventions. But you can learn those in, in yeah, in, in minutes, I guess, compared to maybe more So now let's look what this thing is about. Ah, yeah, right. So being 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 a successor of most of the other build tools, it integrates most of their features. So that's the cool part. You can actually use build XML files from end still, if you have you know your project depends on one of those projects, you can use them. Um, it also can use so-called end tasks. End tasks are basically yeah, end tasks is the kind of additional features that you can uh, add to end. For example, interact with FTP services to do um, XML um, transformations on something common do, even to use SCP, do copy, but for example. So a lot of those extensions or end tasks are available. They can also be used by Gradle scripts. Pretty cool. Um, Maven prompts can be consumed as well because they are can be converted easily. Uh, into Gradle um, script as well. Uh, and of course, it still makes use of the uh, maven slash id repository principle. So there's no Gradle repository concept, it's basically a maven concept. So it's kind of a mix of both words. You see how this tries to integrate all those different aspects. Um, and that is kind of the you know feature set that, maven, that makes Gradle probably uh, reasonably future proof, if you like, in terms of its um, perspective. Dependencies we know are specified this way, right? We say uh, dependencies for the compilation stage for this particular is this particular project, right? So if we talk about project dependencies, dependencies, we know this already. Dependencies for for actual runtime compilation, we rely on those additional. Yes, of course, we have the explicit um, library specification, in which case it's downloaded remotely. So. So it's quite quite a bit uh, different. I'm, I'm not getting as far. Yeah, I don't know. Could have shown some many examples of coding, but it's relatively straightforward. Um, so what it usually does, and that's why it takes so long, <laughs> is initializing the build system. That's the painful bit. That's when we are Android Studio starts, and you can go for a coffee or something else. Um, I'm not sure if you have that experience. I have it every time. It tries to, of course, resolve all the resources that you use, and those are a lot, actually, in average Android uh, project, even without doing anything constructive at that stage. Um, and it resolves then the dependency graphs, um, again, you know, figuring out the nested dependencies and downloads them when necessary, has them in background, also looks for updates of the respective ones. If you, for example, don't specify the version of a particular plugin, it will download the latest version of it as well, so it's kind of annoying. Uh, but well, and the um, execution, um, yeah, then of course performs the actual execution. So that's the kind of stuff that is actually happening there, and it can be quite, uh, uh, it can take some time sometimes. All right. So I think I'll just uh, what I want to do. That. So uh, one thing that will confuse people generally, I believe. Um, oh yeah, it's the answer to this one. Um, is that you have multiple um, builds or greater files. Right, so um, you have them as seen uh, before as well, and and the idea is there that they sit on different levels. So one of them is more on the project level, the other one more on the module level. In most cases, your project is equal to your module, if you like, but they still manage in different build files. Um, and and the main main uh, difference is that the uh, project only contains the settings cradle, so that's more like um, project-wide settings that apply to all modules, and the top-level build file, uh, whereas the end has a build file that's specific to your particular module, of course, and it has actually also many of the file system representations, such as you know, build directory, library directory, but also source directory, which is built by convention. So that's something that's the layout you're comfortable with. So if you find multiple build files, that's part of the reason, and you can differentiate them by looking at, uh, they actually write whether they're a module build file or whether they are project build file. Um, you, you'll see it written in top, even though it's not explicit unless you open them. Um, so it's slightly annoying this one. So um, yeah, just one, one comment on repositories. So in, in, in those um, build, build or grape files, 
you will find that the repositories are actually very integrated and they are resolved to the following URLs or updated accordingly. Uh, this one, for example, maybe sent to the center of Google. You can also do that on your own, right? You can actually define your own repository URLs as well. If you, for example, hosting your own one, just to be aware. Because you will never see those URLs. In you know, greater scripts, you only see reference to, uh, often to Maven Central. Let's see if I can just click into this one. Um, but generally, not much more. Okay, we have a full view with setup. We have one builder data file that opted on project level, identified some dependencies, um, so relies on the applied part in. Um, Tool was slightly older, uh, SDK, um, minimum SDK 25. So, um, just more general parameters and then the module specific ones. Uh, sorry, project specific one, other way around. I was at the um, module specific one, sorry. Um, and this is basically everything that um, applies across all modules. So, this module was specific to a particular interaction mechanism for with Firebase. Um, but this one is more generally. It says, for example, which repositories to use and in which order. So it uh, recognizes the Google repository and Base Center. I didn't put the name Central there, whatever. The dependencies that apply across all possible modules and so on. And, um, you know, possible, possible other um, annotations that are So initial command delete, for example, but also then uh, highlighting, uh, setting the variables for support library work. So if not other, otherwise specified in the project module specific, where those um, will actually, um, those parameters will apply, those properties will apply in all projects, in all modules as well. So I'm even, I'm getting completely confused by this. So um, you still have this nestedness similar to the POMs, but here it's slightly more explicit by knowing how the hierarchy looks like. That's set that specific to Android, of course. Your approach, of course. But it's important to know this um, as well. Okay, I don't think I have anything time for anything else anymore. Um, you can manually run tasks in Rails that shows where those flexibly as well. You can build reports. Um, even this way, for example, you need to agree to something. They are then also kind of posted, but they give you reports about the build process in HTML format. Uh, quite neat because it's easily shareable as well. Quite nice. Um, the rest is not too relevant because of Android specific aspects, but you just look into your build or create a file and see how it's specified. In older Android uh, versions, um, that doesn't apply to any of the ones that you use anymore. Um, there was different. There was different terminology. There was something like compile. Um, which has become now implementation and API provided. We have been compiled only um, for APK, which is now runtime, uh, runtime only. So new primitives, this particular primitives were needed. So if you open older projects, you find those ones more commonly. Uh, but nowadays you rely on those primitives, in case you're wondering. Um, there's, by the way, the link to the Android game with LSP as also the latest version of the spec uh, that you can look up. Okay, um, was a bit of a rush through here, but uh, oh, we're running over time, so sad. Um, sorry for that. Or am I? Anyway, um, thanks for joining uh, me. Yeah, a bit of an idea of build systems. Um, probably relevant for the exam. Okay. Um, yeah, you need to learn about those things or talk about those things somewhere, somehow, right? So, and see what's the uh, what, what, what existing systems are out there, you know, what they're good at, what they're bad at, where we are at right now, and which alternatives you know. I would have loved to talk about cargo, perhaps we can strip that in next week. Um, so I can talk about this if we can contextualize what is better work. I don't think that's the right point in time right now. But um, that would be good to hear from people that have experienced other build systems as well. Unfortunately, we can't make this today. So thank you very much for your attendance. Um, please. Uh, make your projects internal so they can be reviewed, and please engage in the reviewing process. As I mentioned before, I extended the deadline to the 20th for now. Yes, yes, I'll uh, join you in a second. Guys, please read your emails. Apparently, I just got, I got the. May I please, please validate this because it's like literally just uh, because the guys mentioned it's there. Um, there's is a message on Encia. Um, 
that NCNU cancels all lecture on campus. So there will be no more lectures on campus as it stands. But please validate this in your Norwegian's better than mine. I'll just follow up. Oh, there's an English class too. Oh, so sad. Right. So all lectures on campus. So we need to think about this. Um, uh, we, we need to make a plan for next week, so please don't on our attention to campus link. Do we use the stream so contently, but we hope to find a better stream solution than this. We're not allowed to be on campus at all. We're not allowed to be on campus at all. Okay, cool. So uh, enjoy your... No, we don't. Uh, we are still, of course, in university, but not on campus. We don't need campus anymore. We're in the 21st century, so we can do it online as well. We'll find a way to get in touch with you, but follow up on this message, please. Are uh, the from the other I'm discouraged. Okay. So there you go, I didn't read this. Okay. Okay. I'm sure it's possible to highlight it. Login the whole name. Good. Okay, read your emails, that's the message. But it's all the description on campus. If you have a search, uh, what do you mean? It's right there, all business trips are cancelled. Everyone who comes to Georgia, regardless of country, should have two weeks home for quarantine. That's correct. So uh, all uh, basically that refers to staff more or less. So to us, uh, primarily because we're business trip, then it's either PhD students or staff that go to conferences. Um, then they are discouraged or yeah, they are meant to maintain all insulation. But anyway, now since we can say lecture, it de facto affects everyone. So we need to talk about this uh, more explicitly. Cool. Thank you for the for the update. For for yes, yeah. Uh, that's right. It was literally the last lecture for on campus for the week. Uh, anyway, we keep you posted while I get lab and see how it goes. Uh, things are as usual, but just not here.